Hello everyone and welcome to the Survivor Savant Podcast. I am your host Nathan Newport, the self-proclaimed Survivor Savant himself. And today we are going over the events that occur in Survivor episode 11. 11. Uh, it's called We Are Family. Um, and this episode has, has a lot of things to cover. Uh, one, from the... He, how the amount of days have taken its toll on the uh, castaways. Two, the uh, second time we get to see the survivor food auction or survivor auction. And three, uh, we start to see, um, we start to see more different sides to uh, different contestants as the season starts getting closer and closer to the end. But uh, with that being said, let's uh, get into it. So, it's the night after Brandon's uh, vote out at the Tribal Council, and the castaways are, one, feeling great now that Brandon's gone, um, because he was kind of starting things, and he wasn't really uh, trustworthy, causing a lot of distrust, wasn't uh, less, uh, a lot of dysfunction in the camp, if that means anything. Uh, we then get it, um, we then start to see that, uh, Lex is trying to, uh, apologize for standing up for, uh, Brandon and trusting him more than he did his original, well, closest allies in the tribe, which they're happy to hear Tom and, uh, Ethan are. But uh, after that incident and what has happened and when Lex was trying to uh, uh, defend Brandon, and they're starting to feel a little more, uh, definitely more weary about Lex and how he can easily turn on you just like that. If you mention his name or feel like Hank and Mike can go out, out or try to get him out before you, it, it really does. And it's kind of sink into that that much. It's, I'm not going to lie. If I known that my alliance members were trying to get me out because they see me as a threat, I I would not blame them. Uh, there's got to be some kind of charm to me I mean, that's too nice, too uh, social, that's too outgoing hang for other people to deal with. So if they were wanting to get me out beforehand and not really he he's thinking and I, I wasn't really noticing that much then I would be in trouble but because this is Survivor and you have to be constantly uh, aware 24-7 no matter how paranoid you might look uh, you always gotta keep that, that social awareness around you thinking oh maybe they, they still like me as an ally or maybe they don't like me after that recent uh, incident trying to get hit Frank out. Like, I'm just using this when Lex is trying to get Frank out. So, as an uh, example. And, uh, you know, you really got to play out these scenarios in your head. And you know, who would see you as a threat? Who you think uh, might be and somebody you might trust further in the game as the game progresses? And... As long as you play those scenarios in your head, how this could work and how it develops as the game continues, then you're thinking 12, maybe 15 steps ahead against somebody else in this game. And that's pretty important. Always think, think more steps ahead in the game when it's right. And make sure that the other players don't suspect that you're thinking beforehand before they get you out. It's a uh, it's a crazy process. It's uh, really uh, challenging, but overall, if you can accomplish that, then you got much of a better chance to winning Survivor. And so it's getting late at night. Uh, Kim Powers, little Kim, um, and Ethan were up late at night keeping a fire lit, and they had their spears uh, just in case. Uh, so. I probably, I mean, it's been said before that their only protection 
and I say that in quotes because let's face it there's people behind the scenes and they probably got like uh people all trained with guns in the background um waiting to uh fire or warn shot animal well just in case they come in close contact with the contestants but uh their only protection is the uh this uh thorny bush fence that they have circled around their camp and that's the only thing that could prevent pre prevent uh prevent prevent um other animals from from getting in and possibly destroying their camp um so they're up late at night and they hear a lion uh not necessarily ro roaring but uh, like growling as they're circling around the fence and i think they almost try like attempting the uh they almost tried attempting to jump the bush fence, but no success. That just goes to show that keep up to date on that uh, fence and you don't have to deal with lions. You know, you only gotta deal with uh, keeping the fire lit and be on the lookout. And rightfully so, they were getting nervous because if I was, if I was in a close encounter with a wild lion, I mean, I would definitely be nervous too. Uh, then I know Big Tom was uh, up late at night and he kind of kept had both of them at comfort and uh, we get into the next day morning next day uh, now it's been like past 30 days now I should say uh, well not necessarily past 30 days yet I'd say past 25. I think 25 is like a better number to say you know, as far as how many days have passed. And the contestants are really starting to notice how much change has happened with their bodies. You know, Lex has lost a lot of weight. Uh, Big Tom, who, uh, when he started the game, he definitely had, had a big stomach. But as he lays down, you know, the big stomach would kind of like uh, flatten a bit. But when Tom lays down after her, how many weight he's, how much weight he, he's uh, lost, his stomach or his uh, gut is like sunk. Like you can see like his, uh, like his rib cage. It's not like down to where he's like full skeleton now, but he's definitely down to a point where when he lays down and his stomach flattens, you can see like his rib cage I, if I had like a skeletal uh, structure system I'm going to show you like here's the skeletal system and you notice here this is where the uh, rib cage is this is where Big Tom um, lays down and you could see where the rib cage is showing like if I had, had like a, an anatomy he chart to show you who I feel like, like I could have showed you what it would have been like uh but I think the person who's definitely uh, kind of had uh, the most hard, I would say, is Kim Johnson. Because her legs look so swollen. Like, I remember at one point she was taking her socks and shoes off. And you could see that there was, like, swollen that is coming on her, on her uh, calf. And the rest of her foot looks like it's just, like, uh, pale or uh, not necessarily white, but... Oh boy. And she was poking at her foot too and she poked it hard and it just stayed there. Like the skin didn't like rise back up or anything. It, ugh. Holy cow. I would hate to be going through that at that moment. Um, and it doesn't actually make things better when and they have to deal with the food that they've been eating, which has mostly been consistent of corn. Yes, corn. Mm. Very tasty. Um, so they've had like three things that's consistent with corn. One is gruel, uh, which can be made with like corn maize or corn flour. Um, and then another thing is this like watery soup. 
that has corn nibs in it. I'm like, well. And another thing that they sometimes do, which is somewhat better, but it's not like popcorn, you know? They do cook the corn uh, kernels on a skillet and some of the corn kernels burn, but it's not gonna like pop into popcorn. It's not gonna do that. So they just eat it like that. And some parts of it get stuck in your teeth and I'm like, this is why popcorn is not normally like a big uh, snack thing for me eh, all the time. I mean, I have popcorn occasionally at the movie theaters, but if you wanna get like a, a good snack option and for me to eat, um, it's gonna be honey mustard pretzels. I prefer either Snyder's and Handover or Dots. I like either one of those. Although I do like the Dots more. I'm sorry. I used to be a, a honey, Snyder's of Handover person because I love the flavor of the honey mustard or one that they got, but it was a little too, uh, anytime I try to snap into it. I don't know if they uh, made them more crunchy lately, but if you try breaking it, it's almost like Hank, you're uh, attempting, attempting to like break it, make your tooth. I could be wrong. Maybe you know changed since then. I could be wrong. I would definitely have to give those in our taste. But yeah, when it comes to having honey mustard pretzels, I'm more of a Dots home style uh, pretzels kind of person. But anyway, enough with the talk about food because this is just getting us into for what's coming up next. Ladies and gentlemen, you love it. You are going to have it sold. It's the return of the Survivor Auction. This is the second time that uh, this has appeared. The first time ever appeared was last season in Survivor Australia, not back. Now this time, instead of regular U.S. money. Wait, did they use regular money? I think. It could have been regular U.S. money. I could be wrong. Uh, last season, but this time they're using African currency. In this case, it's shillings. Now they're each given you know, about twenty-five thousand shillings, which I I think twenty-five thousand and shillings things is the right one because twenty-five thousand shilling things is like equivalent to two hundred and fifty shilling things. I mean, I'm not a currency or a money guy, but but I try to learn how currency works in this world, and I'm having a hard time and trying to keep up with my hey only at this point. But nonetheless, um, so they're each given twenty five thousand shillings, and items will be in bidding increments of like a thousand or a hundred, and he'll. Jeff will present an uh, item and they have to bid on it like any other regular auction would work. Once you want that item, you have to bid the highest number. Whoever has the highest number will have that item. So if you really want it, bid higher. And once he says going once, going twice, sold, you get that item. Now some of the items are gonna be covered too. So you don't know what you're gonna get. Who knows, you might get a uh, freaking, uh, like, cow's blood again from the one challenge. Uh, luckily, it doesn't happen in this. Uh, spoilers, I'm sorry. But, um, so, the first item up for auction was coffee with sugar and a chocolate croissant. Lex got the bid on the item. Um, he spent, like, a... Uh, I think 6,000 shillings, if I'm not mistaken. And it was really good. I mean, I said it before, I'm not big like a uh, black coffee person. And like recently, you know, I've only had a black coffee just because it's been helping and clear out my phlegm, which by the way, I'm totally good now. And I don't know, if I had another chance to drink black coffee again, maybe I'll have it again, but I like my coffee with cream, just so everybody knows. Uh, next item up for bid was the uh, cheese and crackers. And this wasn't like slices of cheese too. This is like a wedge of cheese. And 
there were like four crackers on there. And Kim Johnson got the bid on that item. She took a bite of the cheese first. And <clears throat> I don't blame her. Uh, I'm a, okay. I love a good charcuterie with the salami, uh, pepperoni. -y. Uh, I'm kind of particular with my cheeses only because I've never really had that much uh, cheeses. I mean, and I do like crackers. The only thing I I don't normally see myself having all the time is wine because most of the time, I the only time I would ever drink wine is at uh, Ornette Suppers and I'm just not much of a, a alcoholic or a spirit or a person. And which I, I'm i mostly proud of, but for those of you who, who do, who um, drink alcohol, all, and as long as you're managing yourself well with that, power, more power to you. I give you that. But yeah, I'm mostly a water person. The alcoholic, alcoholic, as I call myself. But as we're talking about alcohol... The next item up for bid was beer. And it's not in like a mug or yeah. It was like almost like a like a chalice. And not like the fancy metal chalice that they had in medieval times. This was like a glass uh chalice. And out of all the people who could have bid on it, Big Tom. Big Tom got to have the beer. <laughs> And he got a happy dance after he took, took a drink from it. So, um, we then get into the next item. And I'm sorry for all you sugar lovers who had to hear this. The next item was a sundae with hot fudge. And uh, Kim Powers had bid on it and she won it. She's really happy. Meanwhile... Jeff offers up a bowl or a cup of extra chocolate syrup and Ethan and bids on it and successfully you know, he wins it and I mean I like I'm a dessert person but I like to have like a good meal more than I do with sweets right now I need the protein I, I need the protein. Now, the next item up, um, it was going to remain covered, and nobody even knows what it was going to be once it was revealed. So, everybody was bidding blind, not really knowing and what it was. Uh, Kim Johnson and uh, Teresa were fighting for it. No, wait. Yeah. Well, I can only recall Kim Johnson and trying to bid for it because she did win it. And what was it? As Jeff would say, a heck of a meal. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. Oh my goodness. I love fried chicken. Like, I'm not like a KFC person, but when you offer me fried chicken, I'm going to take it. I love fried chicken. Now, some of them were actually, some of the other contestants who saw Kim's Dish were actually offering some money. He need to uh, have some of the chicken, including Lex and Teresa. And Kim was offering a big number. Hers and then Teresa uh, was shaking her head no. And little, uh, little Kim and was just uh, telling her, come on, go for it. You haven't eaten yet. And uh, Lex was offering some money. And then Kim Johnson finally like took it. And, and she was like, going once? Going twice, and then Jeff was like, wait, Kim, let me help you out with that. Sold. And uh, Lex got to have some of the chicken along with it, uh, Kim and Johnson. Next item up was a hoagie. And it wasn't like, uh, like a sandwich hoagie with like regular meats. It was a meatball sub hoagie. And it had cheese on it with the sauce and, okay. It's been a long time since I had like a meatball sub. I I go to Subway. Anytime I go to Subway, I normally get myself like a like a good roast beef sub with provolone and the lettuce and honey mustard. 
I keep mentioning honey mustard because I'm a honey mustard person. I can't help it. But no, it's been a long time since I had a good meatball sub. Maybe if I actually go back to Subway and one of these days, maybe I'll give it a try. You know, just because I want to be nostalgic, you know. But anyway, the Teresa bids on the item and she's won it. She takes a bite out of it and I don't know who asked her, her but somebody asked how it tastes and she, her exact words were, it's so good it makes you want to slap your mama. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, okay, when you hear a southern woman like T-Bird say hey, something makes you want to slap your mama, you know that this is a good meal and you're missing out. And Frank knows that too, and he actually, he, he gets to, he's actually splitting the meal with Teresa, or Teresa splitting the meal with him, to be more accurate. Now, uh, the last item up for grabs was going to remain covered. Now, Tom was wanting to buy this item, so Ethan actually, he handed, offered, or it's, well, just split it, just split the money, and they get to split the meal, and Big Tom was able to get the item, and, oh my goodness, so, what was underneath, uh, Jeff was like, all right, Big Tom, I hope I didn't do you wrong, and Tom looked underneath the, like, lid, hid, or cover of the item and he was like he did me wrong he did me wrong i hate you i hate you i'm gonna kiss you <laughs> because the item turned out to be like a full breakfast plate like there were pancakes with butter eggs and bacon and with maple syrup up <laughs> and then tom <laughs> he uh he liked ethan and for her letting him get the dish and he knew he was gonna let him eat the bacon because he's a Jew and he doesn't eat eat pork or ham which in retrospect is kind of offensive to the Jewish community because they don't eat pork um, but uh, Ethan kind of uh, doesn't take any harm to that after or everybody thought it was insensitive and shouldn't be brought up but Ethan finds no offense to that you know he sees Big Tom as like somebody who uh, jokes even though he doesn't mean it like he knows Big Tom better than that so he's he's shugging off off and he he had a good attitude about it and then Big Tom and Ethan got to share the meal of course Ethan didn't eat the bacon <laughs> He got to eat the eggs with the pancake, eggs and maple syrup. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm definitely going to be needing food after this episode. <laughs> um, so that's the end of the auction. Uh, everybody's left full and happy. Uh, everybody got food. Some got split with others. And, you know, everybody loves going to the Survivor Auction for food. Now... We are fortunate enough to see that nobody is dealing with any stomach pains after or eating those meals. Uh, you know, everybody was also, again, on the fence about Big Tom's comments about telling you know, Ethan's a Jew and he doesn't eat pork and all that. But again, Ethan takes no offense to it. And then we then get another uh, scene where Big Tom is playing checkers with uh, some of the castmates. And... There was this like makeshift checkerboard or with different rocks painted a different color like red and yellow and surprisingly big tom is showing that he's not just a regular uh good old boy from from virginia like he's not that stupid he knows how to be he play people in checkers apparently and it just kind of goes to show how big tom is playing this game and He's not really showing that much and you know people were kind of underestimating him at some point but now they're starting to see that maybe big tom isn't 
all that he says he is. And people are catching wind of that. And we then cut to the watering hole where everybody's just like deciding that they need to take a bath and everyone. And now, full disclosure here, everybody at that time was like either wearing shorts or for the girl, almost they were wearing baby suits. Or in some cases, the guys they were just wearing their underwear. Full disclosure. So everybody was bathing and Big Tom was holding this like bowl, big bowl or bucket and filled with water and pouring over them like it was a shower. And then at some point, hey, Big Tom was like, hey, helping out with the girl holes and, and pouring water on them. And then, oh boy. Uh, I'm not going to say too much because we know that Big Tom... He's a good old country boy, hey, that does a little harmful stuff and sometimes gets away with murder by getting away with uh, helping a woman shower her and uh, I'm going to stop talking much further because it almost makes me he, he, uh, uncomfortable to talk about it, but big time, you big old dirty dog. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, okay, let's be real. Everybody can normally be really uncomfortable on the fact that they're all at the same area where they're all bathing and trying to get themselves clean. And normally you'd be very sensitive about having your own privacy and making sure nobody sees you and while you're trying to clean yourself up. But apparently after the last few days that they spent each other, they don't really care that much anymore. And they seem to grow closer now. So they don't mind. And they're more uncomfortable than with uh, baby bathing each other. Her and, and washing. And they're still almost in front of each other. They've come to close that. They've become a, like a family now. Which, in retrospect from uh, Ethan's point of view is what makes this game hard because you've grown really good with these people and you've really uh, found a lot of connections with them. Um, you really enjoy their company, but this is still a game for Survivor. Uh, this is a game of Survivor. It's a game for a million dollars and one person has to be there at the end and to win it all. And it can't be all of us, so. As much as it breaks my heart, we still have to go through the phase of voting each other out, which makes the game such such a difficult thing. You know, you really have a good time with these people, but you still need to play the game. Um, I know a lot of people back at home are watching it and it's going, man, this game is easy. I don't care about these people. I can and win this with no uh, emotional connection. And it's, I got this hands down. I'm like, okay, we'll look forward to you who bursting into tears after you vote somebody out or when somebody you felt closest to gets voted out. We'll see. Um, I'm not sure how well I would do who if somebody I was very close to got voted out. Um, I, I myself, you know, I was born an introvert being autistic and I find myself to where I can be more comfortable around people and really uh, express myself of as far as what my hobbies are, what are my interests, and really show them uh, how how awesome um, it is to like be around people with such different uh, backgrounds and different hobbies and different interests. And I'm more comfortable with that now, and I'm not afraid to uh like talk to them about different topics i mean two topics i know i'll never talk about with people though who are politics and the news because i don't like it's a down it's a real crowd uh it's real downhearted and i don't know i feel like it would just like ruin in people those days so the less i hear about that stuff the better 
But anyway. Um, but yeah, I feel like, heck, if I was somehow able to connect with people and be able to bond with them over a certain topic, then I can say you know, for sure that I may have been more an introvert, but I have grown since then and become such an extrovert. And I feel like that's what uh, it would be awesome to see if I was on Survivor. Knowing that I'm normally seen as somebody who's very introverted and shy and doesn't really talk that much to people. To now being seen as somebody who's easy to talk to, easy to communicate with. And really you know, get that connection with people. And get people excited about that stuff. I feel like if that was my game on Survivor, I feel like that would be the best story ever to end my game. And knowing that if I was on Survivor to be the first person on the spectrum to win... I can guarantee you that's what uh, that's what would make an awesome season. Um, but anyway, we gotta get back into the game now. Now, again, Big Tom and Le uh, Ethan are still skeptical of Lex, even though he's apologized. They still feel like and he can't trust him. Um, after he sided with Brandon, so if Tribal Council does come back around, then um, and. Lex doesn't get immunity again, then they're voting him out. So we get to the next reward cha uh, immunity challenge. Not reward, jeez. Uh, we get into the next immunity challenge, and this challenge is called Survivor Folklore. Now, this is the third time this challenge has premiered. The original time it premiered was back in, in uh, Survivor Borneo, you know, the very first season. Um, now, this time, the folklore is about the African rituals of a warrior from birth to death the warrior's journey now I'm not going to recall any all of the uh, events that occur with this because they might be a little sensitive to some um, viewers or listeners of this podcast um, but here's how the challenge works once Jeff has told the story he, they're each given in the staff with different and uh, tribe uh, with different uh, colors on it. There are like seven, or I believe seven in colors with hit the uh, staff on it. And here's how it works. At each station, and there are seven different stations where they'll have a different question. Now, if those stations are, are being used at the moment, you gotta uh, let the other castmates know, know by pu putting this like rope guard on it at the second fire, hey, keep out, somebody's using this area already. Now there'd be a question referring to one of the uh, uh, scenes or, or things that have happened within the folklore. And there will be two answers, one true, wolf, one false, in the form of ostrich eggs. If you get the correct one by, now uh, once you have uh, guessed what the answer was, you take an ostrich egg and break it, and if you get it right, inside will be a colored leather strip that you must place on your staff in the right area. If you get it wrong, you get nothing, and you gotta go to a different station. Once you have five colored leather strips and you have them tied at the exact place where it is on your staff, first person back with five leather strips uh, on your staff wins immunity now i'm going to like try my best to recall er not every but some of the uh, uh question is and answers that i were in the uh, in the survivor folklore challenge now one was uh, now one was a question where what is the best time to What was... Oh my gosh. Alright. Okay. The question was... After a baby is born... What must be done? Uh, the mother... Her must drink the blood of a cow... Or a goat must be sacrificed. And then... I believe you know, the correct answer was... A goat must be sacrificed. And... What are the uh, customs, first customs of, of, uh, 
being an African warrior. Uh, the removal of the, their two bottom teeth, middle bottom teeth, or the piercing of the ear. Correct one was piercing of the ear. And I, uh, I, I think those are the only two I can recall at the moment. And, and the, the one that I can't recall, but I can't figure out the answer there's right now and tell you guys they're in there, but I'm not gonna uh, like, make, uh, I don't wanna stumble or mix up information because it's uh, really important that this information is recalled correctly. So I don't wanna like make waste my time and giving you guys the wrong information. So with that being said, um, we get into a challenge a lot further uh, Big Tom is having no luck. He's getting, uh, getting most of the answers wrong. Uh, you got some contestants that get the answers right, like Kim Johnson to uh, Ethan. And then uh, Teresa and Ken and Powers. Even though they got some right, they do get most of them wrong. Um, then you have Frank and Lex. Two of them, the two of them were getting the most answers correct, guessed correctly. Uh, when it was coming down to uh, who were getting the, like the most uh, ledger strips and who got them correct and placed properly, Lex was at that point in where he was done until one of the ledger strips fell off his staff. And as Lex was coming back to the center of the challenge, he was showing Lex, but I mean, uh, Jeff, his staff, but he then realizes he's missing a ledger strip and Jeff tells him he has to go back for it. Uh, it's crazy. It's uh, really, uh, it's a lot of pressure. And Frank was just getting his, his all finished up. And then Lex found uh, his uh, letter strip. Now Jeff told him he has to have it in the correct spot in order for her to win. And after untying it and retying it properly, just as Frank was coming out, Lex again wins immunity. Now Lex is safe at Tribal Council. He's not going to go home, and that just leaves the other six to have to worry about being sent home home next and being a third member of the jury. Now we cut to day 30, and we wake up and see Frank enjoying the sunrise, and he's here in Africa. Now it's honestly like a really beautiful scene. Like you could have this as a background on your computer screen or even the background hound of your uh, iPhone. Like it's just really a really beautiful scene to witness. And if I was there, I would absolutely take a picture of that because I want to remember that for the rest of my life if I was there. But uh, something in Frank was like really like feeling more humble and grateful that he was more alive. And we don't really get to see that much uh, emotion coming from Frank, which is honestly a good thing. Um, I mean, not that he doesn't show emotion all the time. I mean, it's good that Frank's showing emotion and like he's enjoying this really sentimental moment. And then Frank decides to uh, talk. And if you know Frank, um, he doesn't really have a lot of things that he's more uh, comfortable. How do I put this? Frank likes to share things that nobody normally would never share. Like, there are some topics that Frank was talking from, like, pro guns and how, you know, they're more restricting in gun guns because... Because, you know, they see guns as more dangerous than other things. You know, it's easy to kill whole people with other things, like a knife or a, a piece of fishing line, he said. As that, that could be something that could be used to kill someone with. And that uh, guns don't kill people. People with guns kill people. I'm like, uh, I mean, he didn't actually say that, but... And then... He was getting into politics and then and 
because everybody was trying to tell him to stop and cut it out because people were definitely getting sensitive about that stuff and especially Ethan who's sitting right next to Frank he wasn't saying anything but you can tell by the look on his face that he was uh clearly uncomfortable about it here's this is why I'm not interested in talking about politics like it's a sensitive topic it's not really something that needs to be like everybody has their own opinions about stuff whether you're a liberal what are you're a conservative whether you're uh a libertarian or republican and democrat whatever everybody has their own opinions on things me i'm keeping it to myself because politics really isn't and something that honestly and i know probably some of you are probably gonna hate me for it politics is something that just ruins people's lives because it's just non-stop arguing I just don't get the point of politics. It's just nothing but nonstop arguing and nobody can agree on anything. So it's just, what's the point of bringing that stuff up? If nobody's going to agree with anything and it's just doing nothing but bringing people uh, uh, vibes down. I don't, I don't mean to sound like a freaking dippy hippie, but like, let's not bring the vibe down. Like, Let's bring it up more and stop talking about how stuff that's more like a like a party pooper. But anyway, that's my uh, thoughts about that stuff. Now, Teresa is taking notice of this and she really wants to see her and Frank stay longer in the game. So even though Frank's got his little deal that probably ruined his game, she's still going to try his best, her best to keep both of them around. And she tries to put the target on uh, Ethan, who's definitely seen as like a charming threat, both socially and physically, uh, because he has done well in challenges. Uh, he's gone along so well with everybody. Like, there's not a bad thing you can say about Ethan, which is why he's such a threat. And if he stays around longer in the game, you know you're going to have trouble. So uh, she was definitely bringing those points up. And whether or not, I know that Kim Johnson, she made an alliance with Ethan. And they have trusted with each other ever since they've been on Baron. And it'd be hard for her to do that. So as much as she knows that it's probably best for her game to have Ethan out, she's not going to do that. Because she has started a pack with him and she's not going to break it anytime soon. Which, by the way, you would definitely want an alliance partner. I know people nowadays on Survivor are like, if I got my ally now, that would be a bold uh, checklist move on my Survivor resume. I'm like, uh, okay, do bold moves, okay, but you know you're hurting your friendship that you made with someone else. So that's, uh, I don't know. I have different reasons on why that's pros and cons, but I'll get into it another time. But we get into Tribal Council. Now, we have the two jury members sitting over there. And they're everyone at Tribal is more talking about uh, loyalties and allies and uh, who they consider to be uh, trustworthy and who would they rather keep around longer in this game due to how much they like them. Um, now... We can already kind of tell where this is going from here. And unfortunately, after Frank vote for Kim Johnson, uh, everybody, and sadly, including T-Bird, who admittedly, she tried to help save, but she knew that she couldn't and, and, uh, defend herself if she had voted to her side with Frank. Um... Uh, she had no choice and she chose to write Frank's name down, which led to Frank being the third member of the jury and vote out of this game. But we get a nice, another sentiment, that's a moment from Frank, uh, thanking his wife and his kids for letting him be on this journey. Uh, he's proud to be either her, his, uh, her husband and their father and He's thankful for this journey and 
he's glad that he's got to live it. So I know Frank's had his moments where he's been all serious and more business than and more personal or trying to be like a, a class clown or all that. But he's had moments where he's definitely stand out as somebody anybody would like. Like I said before, he's like a younger version of Rudy. You know, everybody, he's got a Rudy. He, he's grouchy. He's not really he, that much of a personal talk. And, you know, everybody, he's like, uh, everybody in their life's got someone like Rudy. And Frank was one of them. But with that being said, uh, thank you guys so much for watching this podcast episode. Uh, the food auction. Now, next episode, there's going to be a, a much bigger prize than I've ever seen in this season so far. Um, it's really cool. It's really exciting. It's really thrilling. And man, I am more jealous than ever that I wish I could have gone to this. But we'll save that for another time. Until then, thank you guys so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed being outsmarted, outclassed, and outspoken with the Survivor Salon Podcast. This is Nathan Newport, signing out. See ya.